Good evening. Desperate times, extraordinary measures. $130 billion to keep millions of Australian workers paid and employed. Tonight, we'll ask experts and political leaders how a wage subsidy will work, who's eligible and how we'll all pay for it. And we'll be talking to you from a very safe distance via video about how you've been financially impacted by this crisis. You've got so many questions tonight, so let's get you some answers. Welcome to Q&A. Joining us in the studio tonight, the CEO of the Commonwealth Bank, Matt Common. In Canberra, we're joined by the CEO of the Business Council of Australia, Jennifer Westacott. Economist Nikki Hutley is here as well, and singer-songwriter Josh Pike, whose tour and income are now effectively on hold. A little later in the program tonight, we'll hear from some politicians, the Assistant Treasurer, Michael Sucker, and Shadow Minister for Families and Social Services, Linda Burney. I know you've got lots of questions following today's announcements, and we are going to try and get answers to as many of them as possible. You can stream us live on iview and on YouTube. Join in on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Instagram. Quanda is the hashtag. Uh, keep the sanitizer nearby if you're doing that. Our first question tonight comes from Chris Round in Bellevue Hill. A study by Bristol University found that if the response to the COVID-19 pandemic led to a fall of more than 6.4% in Britain's national income, more lives would be lost because of the recession than they would be gained by beating the virus. I assume the numbers would be similar in Australia. And with more measures set to be brought in, there's a chance we'll do irreparable damage to the lives of millions more Australians. So, could the cure actually be worse than the disease? Nikki Hartley. Yeah, look, this is the absolute wicked problem that we are facing. And, you know, some people, like the Brazilian president today, will say, not going to do anything about this. We'll just let old people die and that's fine. But it's not that simple because it's not just old people. The health, you know, it spreads right through the community. Our health system gets overwhelmed. We, we have a, a massive problem. Yes, there will be incredible economic and social hardship for people through this. We know that people being cramped up at home, that leads to increased domestic and family violence. We know that people will do incredibly hardly... Uh, diff diff it'll be difficult for them financially. Lots of people are losing their jobs already. We think probably a million in the last um, couple of weeks, uh, you know, 12% unemployment already. There is no simple solution to this, though. This is one of the most wicked problems that any government anywhere has ever faced. I don't believe that you can just say, we're going to just let these people die. Um, morally, we can't do that anyway. But even if you were to value those lives as, 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 as less than others, it's, it's an impossible decision. But, Matt Common, <coughs> GDP growth is, is strongly linked to health outcomes, mm -hmm. mortality rates. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is not as simple as asking a question about our health and lives versus the economy. There's, there's impact on human life no matter what you do here, isn't it? Absolutely. And I don't think you can frame it, as you said, as a choice between it's one or the other. You know, as Nikki was saying, you really have to put the health risks first, accepting that there are real consequences from the actions that we're taking. That's why the government's announcement, which I'm sure we're going to come to, is so important today, because I think it's a very positive set of measures which is going to seek to limit some of the economic downside. But inevitably, we're facing across the community some very difficult choices. But I think the focus from both the federal and the state governments to make sure that they're protecting our citizens, making sure that we're protecting our health workers and our healthcare system uh, is the right set of priorities. And then we've just got to work on the sets of measures collectively across you know, a number of different stakeholders to make sure that we can effectively suspend parts of the economy and enable that core infrastructure to then re-emerge and rebound strongly when we get through this period. Uh, Jennifer Westacott, Clearly there is a fear that some Australians have when they've looked at the measures that governments have put in place around our health and uh, social distancing, etc., that there is pressure from business to move on the economy at the expense of our health. Uh, is there? Well, I don't think it can be at the expense of our health. I think we've got to get... Um, we've got to contain this thing. We've got to double down on the people who are vulnerable from getting sick, you know, particularly people over 70. So I don't think you can, you can say at the expense of health, but we do have to make sure that we can function as a society, 
How do we keep our telecommunications going? How do we produce food? How do we keep our retailers going? How do we keep our power on? How do we keep our mining and resources sector going? How do we keep our banking system, which has been magnificent through this crisis, going? And then how do we start thinking about rebounding after that? And, and of course, there are very complex issues, as Nikki said, with very, very complex supply chains. But I think one of the really crucial things we have to do, Hamish, is, is give people a sense of confidence that we can get out of this, we will come out of this, we started in a stronger position. We had a stronger set of economics, a strong set of banks. We've really got to paint a picture of hope for people because I think the biggest ingredient that's missing at the moment is hope. But let me just finish on, you cannot make the health a trade-off issue. Um, obviously, as Nikki said, this is a wicked problem, but uh, the health must be paramount. And I, I'd like to see us doubling down a little bit harder on the people who are at risk. What do you mean by that? Well, you know, should we be isolating people uh, who are over 70? How, how do we start thinking about, I know a lot of the retailers are thinking about this, how do we get food to people so that they don't have to go out? How do we minimise their exposure? Because we know that, uh, you know, it doesn't, it's not confined to people over 70, but we know that you're in a higher risk category if you're over 70. So how can we make sure that we contain this, but we also double down on protecting the people who are most at risk. OK, Josh Pike, when you hear business leaders say we've got to talk about the optimism, I mean, Warwick McKibben, who was on uh, the board of the Reserve Bank during the global financial crisis, has done modelling on this. He's expecting, at this point, an 8% cut to GDP this year, uh, unemployment to go to 12%. From where you sit, do you see much to be optimistic about? Uh, it's, a, it's a difficult question. I mean, I think artists are always optimistic and inspired by things like this. So from a creative point of view, I think that we will really rally and try and bring communities together and be positive and create positive outcomes. But in terms of financially, I mean, we're all very, very concerned. Um, you know, our industry has been decimated. My, my personal touring and in, uh, income has been just written off for the next six months. So in terms of optimism, we, we're really focused on trying to get us all through this period so that we can bounce back strongly because, you know, we contribute $15 billion to the economy every year, um, which is something that a lot of people probably don't think of when they think of entertainers. Um, so we, we are, we're, we're cautiously optimistic about the new um, uh, guidelines put in place in terms of subsidies. And I think as artists, it's kind of our responsibility to bring communities together and kind of create that optimism, which we've been doing with live streaming concerts and creating content to people, keep people entertained. So, yeah, I think we are optimistic, but we're definitely, you know, deeply concerned about how the next six months is going to play out for our industry. All right, our next question tonight comes from Alice Weber in St Peter's, New South Wales. Some industries, such as arts, entertainment and fitness, rely on a network of self-employed workers. Will the coronavirus wage guarantee be extended to workers who are self-employed? OK, so, Josh, we know that there are now some provisions in place, but just give us a picture as a community of how tough that is for people that are self-employed, people that are in the arts, in these sort of slashy jobs, as yeah, they described it. Yeah, it's, it's the gig economy. And, you know, we've, we kind of exist on the fringes of, of wages anyway. You know, we, we have multiple jobs. We play shows. We work in hospitality, which is also heavily affected. Um, so it's, it's difficult. And also there's something uh, which, again, people probably wouldn't understand, is that a lot of musicians, we have many different kind of corporate structures and business models, you know, from sole trader to corporate entity with a, a sole employee to, to self-employed. So and we've, we've often fallen between the cracks of subsidies and benefits. So I think everyone's very concerned. And the new, you know, the new announcement, it seems positive, but we, there's just so much we don't know about what kind of, you know... Um, what we need to do to be eligible for those subsidies. So it's, it's, a, it's a huge concern. You know, people have gone from having fallback jobs, which are also dis have disappeared in hospitality yeah. and driving Uber and whatever else it is. So, yeah. Nikki Hutley, uh, in terms of a safety net, do people in this sort of category now have one that wasn't there yesterday? Well, as Josh has just said, it depends on how you're, how you're set up um, because for some people, um, if you don't have a corporate structure and you've just been gigging along, you might be eligible um, for, the, for, for the job seeker allowance. Um, you might have some group together and that might be the job keeper allowance. But again, 
there's, there's a big question mark, and I just got an email from a company tonight at about 6.30 saying you need to think about this, that the measure goes... It's a 30% drop in your income from now versus 12 months ago, not versus the last couple of months. And that raises a whole load of questions about, well, what was your income doing over that period and is that exactly the right measure? And they actually gave them an example where a, a poorly performing company was actually advantaged over a, a, a well good performing company. So there are still lots and lots of questions here. The government has gone as hard as it can. It is trying to fill all the gaps. And so each time they come out with something and then, you know, we economists come out and go, but hold on, what about these people or what about these people? And they are trying their best to fill the gaps. I suspect there will still be some at the end of this and will... But I suspect there will, again, be more on offer. The government has been quite open in saying, you know, this isn't the end of the line here. If we need to, we will do more. And just the amount that they have been prepared to spend today, that, you know, as you said, extraordinary. Um, I think Andrew Proben said gobsmacking, you know, amounts of money that have, 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 have come out. So... Yeah, they will do whatever it takes. But I think the one point that I would make, um, and in relation to the first question, people will slip through the cracks in this. There will be people who will lose livelihoods, whose um, you know marriages will, will collapse. I mean, there will be terrible social and economic consequences. We cannot avoid that. But the government is going as hard as it can through economic and through those other measures announced yesterday around mental health and, and domestic and family violence to try and do what it can to cushion the blow, not to get rid of the blow. Matt Common, is this enough to keep the economy afloat for the next six months, in your view? Look, I think it's a very significant and powerful set of measures that they've announced today. I mean, clearly there's a whole range of things we don't know in terms of what additional containment measures we need to take to ensure that we reduce the rate of transmission of the virus. But you'd have to say, as Nikki said, uh, this is a... I think a very broad base. If you look at the eligibility criteria and both the Treasurer and Prime Minister talked about how this applied and, and how it compared with some of the international schemes, mm -hmm. there is no uh, set of measures that anyone can design that is perfect. So there has to be some constraints that are put in place. I think Nikki's quite right. I think this is a very well designed and it's designed in a way that can it can be practically implemented because you have to work within the constraints of the overall uh, system as well as the processes and you would have heard... So for, for ordinary people that aren't bankers, what does that mean, going through the ATO? <laughs> well, it does, but also, I mean, as we've... And I'm sure a number of other financial institutions have had the opportunity to work with both the Treasury Secretary and the Treasurer and, and his team, and they've watched them sort of work around the clock to design this. It's... You have to understand the way the welfare system has been structured, and, of course, they have created both the, the job seeker and the job keeper, and then you have to find a way to actually deliver the money uh, to the recipients and, and try to capt capture everyone that you possibly can. Inevitably, there might need to be re some refinements. You know, maybe 30% down isn't the perfect measure, but I think it's a pretty good start. It's absolutely right. Though there'll be some imperfections in the measurement period, etc. I think there should be, and I'm sure there will be, a high requirement on people to be a you know, high degree of honesty and self sort of certification, and there should be some pretty severe uh, penalties for anyone who tries to sort of move around and try and capture el you know, eligibility where it's not entitled. And that's I... a retail banker saying that. <laughs> and there's a, I mean, there's a broad range of people who, quite rightly, you know, haven't been able to really understand exactly what's going to apply to them. And so I think we need to all do a, a job of coming together and making sure that we're explaining the package very clearly. We put up some information on our website as, a, as an example, at least, of the prior package. We've had more than two million unique views coming to the website just to understand eligibility. Where do I go to actually uh, you know, pre-register for the new programs? It's already up on the ATO website. I saw that earlier this evening. Does this somehow incentivise businesses to actually try and move staff on or uh, sort of not continue to perform well in this current environment? No, I don't think so. I mean, I think one of the most important design principles in this case has been making sure that there's a very clear connection, and it doesn't capture everyone, but the very clear connection between employers and employees. I think that's really important both psychologically as well as just retaining that, that connection. And the way the program is designed is to be able to deliver uh, the financial benefits uh, directly to employees. There's a number of different ways in which that, that, that's going to be implemented. And I think that's a really important part of what they've been trying to achieve. There are provisions under the Fair Work Act to be able to stand down employees. Uh, when you stand down an employee, you maintain that connection, you're entitled to the full benefits. Uh, you're not having to pay redundancies if, if you're letting your staff go, particularly, obviously, full time. 
you know, as an employee, you're continuing to receive uh, leave entitlements. You also qualify for a range of other subsidies like rent allowance, mm. utility allowance as well, which is why really the numbers are so large. I think a really important point in all of that as well, Matt, is that it's not just about keeping that connection. This is actually giving a whole lot of companies the opportunity to actually stay with their workers exactly. and think about how they might respond to this crisis to pivot to be use consulting speak, you know, and, and be more agile um, to say, all right, well, we're not doing this now, but how about we, we, we've got some trucks, so let's go and deliver food or let's go and think about what it is that you can do now can I, where can I there just is a demand. Can I interject there? I think from in the music industry or the entertainment industry, and particularly in hospitality, there's been a lot of talk about pivoting your business to delivery and stuff like that, but that also requires setting up a, an e-commerce site and an injection of cash to set up a new business and training to learn how to run an e-commerce site. <clears throat> and at this time when everybody's just trying to get by, that's that's also quite a big ask. So I think that's something that people need to take into account as well. Okay, our next question tonight comes from Peter Wally Thompson in Townsville, Queensland. Does anybody seriously believe that you can wind this wage subsidy back after six months? And aren't we looking at the introduction of the basic universal income? Jennifer Westacott, that probably sounded like a wild idea to someone like you uh, six months ago. Uh, but is that ultimately the trajectory that we're on right now? No, I think the government's made it very clear that this is a response to a crisis and they've designed it uh, accordingly. And I think, you know, just to echo other people's comments, I think it's been designed extremely well. Uh, it, it allows people to stay with their employers. As Matt said, you can stand people down, but you can still connect with them. I think the other point that we're missing is that this is on top of a huge package of assistance that was announced the week before, $189 billion, uh, particularly to assist people uh, with companies at $50 million turnover, you know, $100,000, up to $100,000 of withholding tax without going into the technicalities to keep their employees on. And so, and on top of that, um, a doubling of the of the new start allowance to the job seekers allowance, a $750 cash payment, two of those. I think we've got to see the whole thing together. And this has been very carefully designed and carefully calibrated, but it's been designed for a crisis. And I agree with Matt. I think it's important that there are the right design arrangements so that employers keep people on and that we make sure that we keep people attached to their employer and so that they can come back when those companies are up and running again. And I think we just got to... And I think the other point is that the government's shown its willingness day by day to increase things, to adjust things, to change things if things aren't working. And that's a very important thing that we've seen over the next, over the last few months. Okay. And this is such a rapidly changing environment. I, I do want to go to the government, but Nikki Huntley, you're one of the economists that was saying this sort of thing was needed weeks ago. What sort of reaction was it getting? Oh, you know, there was, it was basically poo-pooed by, by a lot of people, in, including the government at the time. And I think, you know, Jennifer makes the point that this has been a rapidly evolving situation, and it has, and I don't think anybody thought... You know, we, we don't know what we're doing here. Okay. We're flying blind into the future. It's going really, really fast. So, you know, you're allowed, you're allowed to sort of have one opinion one week and, and one opinion... As well, long we, as you get to the right We won't give the government answer. a free pass just yet. <laughs> we'll uh, try and understand why that change has come about. Michael Sucker is here, along with Linda Burney uh, from the opposition. Michael Sucker, why this change of heart on a measure like this? Well, Hamish, obviously these are extraordinary circumstances and this is an extraordinary response. Um, as some of the other panellists have said, this has been a very calibrated and methodical approach. At first instance, when it became clear that the economy as a result of the health, health crisis uh, was going to suffer, we really focused on strengthening the safety net. Once it became clear that uh, unemployment was going to rise, we felt that strengthening that safety net was the first most important step, which we did. We also put in place instant support for small and medium enterprises to try and help them to the greatest extent possible hold on to as many of those employees as possible to mean that they didn't need to access those Sure, but those with respect, on that, on that very point, many employers did actually get rid of staff because they didn't think something like this measure was on the way. Do you accept that? Well, Hamish, this has deteriorated very quickly. I think everybody accepts it's moved very quickly, it's evolved and it has deteriorated. And as uh, we have shown, uh, we are able and we are willing to be agile and to deal with each problem as it comes. And 
Uh, I think the word extraordinary and unprecedented has been used for this package because we obviously are faced with extraordinary and unprecedented times. Uh, that has been the modus operandi of the government, but strengthening that safety net at the beginning was the, the key focus. And since then, it's been about how do we keep people sure. connected to their employment? Because we know it's not just an economic issue. Uh, it's a societal or mental health. Uh, and in the end, will enable Australia, I think, at the end of this, uh, to be in a position uh, to take advantage, hopefully, of an improving economy okay. once the health crisis ends. I'm just trying to establish, though, whether you acknowledge that some businesses would have laid off staff in recent weeks because the government was saying that there wouldn't be something like what had been rolled out in the UK. Well, really importantly, today's announcement, Hamish, allows for employees that were uh, connected with their employer on the 1st of March, uh, so some weeks ago, to be able to be a part of this scheme. So uh, if you have been uh, an employee who has been uh, stepped down or uh, lost your job, um, you will be able to re-engage with your employer as a part of the JobKeeper allowance. So it's a recognition from us. This has moved very quickly. Uh, we've got to be pretty novel in how we've approached it, and that's exactly what we've done. Linda Burney, were you surprised at this turnaround? Uh, hello, panel. Hello, Hamish. And hello, Michael. And yes, I do hello, have my hands and sanitizer. Uh, this was a surprise um, and a welcome surprise. Um, I think, as Jennifer said, just last week, uh, the government was ridiculing the idea of a wage subsidy uh, to keep people empl uh, connected to their employer. Uh, the uh, Labor Party uh, has been constructive and worked with the government and supported the government uh, throughout this crisis, and it is a crisis. I talked to some people on Centrelink lines on, on Monday. They were terrified, they were scared and they were stressed. And we must always remember that people are, are at the heart of this. Uh, this $130 billion announcement today is very welcome and the Labor Party does welcome it. Uh, there are some groups uh, that are gaping, gapingly going to miss out, and I'm sure we'll come to that. But when you have a look at this package today, um, it is about keeping people connected to their employer. Uh, we know that it is also very welcome that it's going to cover casuals, but the... Uh, the, um, uh, the bar that's been set is that if you're a casual, you need to be with that employer for 12 months and the employer must demonstrate that 30% of their revenue has been lost because of coronavirus and they are the measures that need to be understood. Uh, on that very point, Linda Burney, uh, we've got a series of very practical questions, Michael Sucker, about yes. these payments. Uh, from Jen Axford, she wants to know how this is applied to casual workers who work for multiple employers. Well, you nominate one employer. So uh, for a casual that's got multiple uh, employers, you nominate one and provided uh, that employer nominates you as well, then that is your primary employer for the purposes of the JobKeeper payment. And you obviously receive one payment uh, of $1,500 a fortnight. Uh, and will this apply... This is a question essentially about uni students. Will this apply to casual employees who've received ongoing, regular and systematic rostered hours but over a prolonged period? Well, the, the rules are quite clear, as stated uh, in today's announcement, which means you've got to have been employed for 12 months by that employer as, it, as of the 1st of March. Uh, that is the, the broad test that we're putting in place for casual employees. And I think it's important to note here, um, and, and I'm sure Linda would acknowledge this, um, you know, a few days ago the argument was about extending this to part-time employees. I don't think anyone expected the government would extend it as far as casuals. We thought that was very important to do uh, because obviously they need to stay to the greatest extent possible connected uh, to their employers as well. So we've been um, really expansive in how we have uh, uh, taken the JobKeeper payment forward and that has obviously extended in a broad way to, to casuals too. OK. I, I, on contractors, Sean Ryan's written in, he's an Uber driver, he says we considered contractors. Uh, in terms of the $1,500 per fortnight JobKeeper payment, does he approach the government for that himself or does he have to get Uber to register and declare him uh, viable for that? 
Well, look, it depends on on your employment relationship. But if you are a... And the question came up a bit earlier about uh, self-employed individuals or sole traders. Uh, If you were operating as a sole trader, self-employed, and you've got an ABN, you can apply yourself. And if you go to ato.gov.au... Uh, You can register an intention to apply even as a sole trader or someone who's self-employed for the JobKeeper payment. Uh, Before I walked into the studio, Hamish, we'd had 65,000 businesses who'd already registered for the JobKeeper payment. So that does extend uh, to self-employed individuals as well. Uh, Linda Burney, what are you hearing from constituents about how confused they are, the challenges in terms of actually trying to navigate this? Uh, There have been numerous calls... Uh, by people that are confused. Uh, Why the government decided to change uh, the name of Newstar to Job Seeker uh, last week was a bit mysterious. But you've got the Job Seeker payment, uh, the Job Keeper payment, and then the $750 stimulus payments that you've spoken to. And people are confused about whether they've registered... If they've registered with Centrelink with an intent to claim the job seeker payment, what does it mean in terms of if they are eligible uh, or their company is el- or their employer employer is eligible for the job keeper payment? Uh, they're the sorts of very confused messages that we're getting, apart from the many calls that we're getting from people that are, that are trapped overseas. OK. Well, we know many businesses are struggling. I've been to meet one pub manager who is doing it tough. Hi, I'm Jana. I'm 23. I've worked at the Cricketers Arms for close to five years and up until a week ago I was employed full time. Um, Now I'm unemployed and waiting to get on Centrelink. When we noticed it was getting quieter, the prospect of having to shut down became realer. We felt that it was better to stop now and we'd have a better chance at reopening in a few months if we did stop. We let go close to 15 people, kitchen and bar staff, security, DJs, bands, people that have worked here for years. It's heartbreaking. This place is normally heaving on a Friday and Saturday night. It's so sad to see it empty. We have probably over 50 kegs of beer, 100 cases of beer in the cellar. What's the value of that? I would say close to $30,000. When you look at that sort of stockpile there in the cellar, what do you think? what goes through your mind. It's really sad. It's a huge waste, not knowing what to do with it. How far does the Centrelink payment go for you? I don't know how far it will go for me. It'll just cover my rent and groceries for the week, but it's not going to cover any bills. I have a little bit of savings behind me, but if I'm waiting till mid to late April for that payment, that'll definitely burn through to cover rent and bills in that time. I feel uncertain because there's no time frame on this. I don't know how long it's going to last. I don't know how long I'll be in this predicament for. There is light at the end of the tunnel, but what's it going to look like when we come out on the other end? I don't know when things are going to be normal again. Are you scared? Um, I am, but it hasn't hit me yet. It doesn't feel real. Well, Michael Suka, what does Yana do? What do her staff do? Do they withdraw their application to Centrelink now and then try and get this uh, job keeper allowance instead? Well, it's very sobering to hear uh, Yana's story, and I think um, so many uh, of us, and even on shows like this, focus on the very macro picture, but uh, there are real people and real lives and real anxieties behind it. Um, The arrangements that will be in place, obviously, if an employer... Uh, is going to be nominating uh, employees for the job keeper payment, uh, which is a higher payment than the job seeker payment. I wouldn't encourage anybody to withdraw an application. Uh, the ATO Services Australia, where there uh, are applications for both, uh, will uh, obviously work out administrative arrangements to ensure that those individuals get the job keeper payment. So I would caution them not to do, not to withdraw an application at this point in time. Um, but obviously, uh, for Yana and all of the employees at uh, the Cricketers Arms, the job keeper payment will be available uh, to them. And uh, at $1,500 a fortnight uh, is obviously uh, higher 
uh, than the job seeker payment and we haven't mentioned the coronavirus supplement of $550 a fortnight. So um, that will be uh, available to them. Um, so, so just to be clear, addition, you're saying sorry, people addition, should keep in multiple applications, both for the job seeker and the job keeper? I wouldn't, I wouldn't encourage anybody to withdraw an application at the moment because we've got a registration process now for employers who will register employees. Uh, as and when that, uh, that is processed uh, and there are uh, an individual who is prima facie entitled to both payments, uh, administrative arrangements will, will be put in place to make sure that they get the job keeper payment and at that point in time uh, all of the other applications will will be removed. So, so the uh, government will preference somebody getting the job keeper payment over the job seeker one? Well, no, that if you are if you are applying for job keeper, if your employer is nominating you for job keeper, that is the payment that you will receive. If you want the job seeker payment and not the job keeper payment, of course you're entitled to do that too, but you will receive one payment and you'll have to fulfil the criteria of that. But you asked my advice at the beginning, Hamish, of whether they should withdraw their application for the job seeker payment. I wouldn't suggest they do that. Uh, and there will be administrative arrangements that, as I'm sure as you would appreciate, need to be put in place uh, between now and this being legislated to make that as smooth as possible for everybody. Linda Burning, I can see you shaking your head at that explanation. Well, the story of Yana, I agree with Michael, is a very um, sobering one. But what she really told us, Hamish, is that no one knows how long this is going to go on, uh, that there's going to be a major social reset um, after this uh, across the world. And she's also saying that she doesn't feel like it's real. And their feelings that um, I think so many people are experiencing. Um, I agree that if Yana has um, registered for uh, Centrelink for the old New Start payment, the job seeker payment, she, sh she should keep that registration in. But she would be eligible for the job keeper payment, the uh, one that was announced today by, uh, by Scott Morrison. But the other point that I think we need to take out of Yana's story, it is one of millions of stories across this country and the rate of unemployment, which I'm sure um, people will comment on, is going to be something like 11 to 12 per cent. Now, we have been here before, and that was the Great Depression, of course, and uh, during the financial crisis. And the, uh, uh, as Cop Morrison likes to say, but when we get to the other side, well, I think what Jan is asking is, what is the other side? All right. Our next question, our next two questions, are from Sharon Curry in Maruya and Susan Thomas in Carlton, Victoria. My question to the panel is, I'm a hairdresser and I really don't see this industry as an essential service. Hairdressing salons are allowed to continue operating. This is very confusing to me, seeing as how I know the advice we, we are continually hearing is no physical touching and keep at a safe distance away from other people. This is an impossibility in this industry. I feel we are putting ourselves and our families at risk. If we decide to self-isolate, then we will be entitled to the new job seeker payment. I'm finding the government is giving mixed messages around coronavirus. I'm currently physically isolating myself from my grandchildren because I'm 63 years old and I'm following the government's advice. I'm also an early childhood educator where I work on the floor directly with children and my colleagues in a long daycare centre. Now, and I'm allowed to work. Now, I know I could choose not to work, but I'm a single woman on a low income, living in social housing, living pay to pay. How do I pay my rent, my food and my bills if I don't work? Linda Burney, this speaks to a lot of the questions that we've had where people find themselves in predicaments that they just can't seem to find their way out of right now. What do they do? Uh, well, I think what we saw there was uh, one of the concerns that many people have, and that is confusion about uh, mixed messages. I mean, you've got the federal government saying one thing, you've got the state governments saying another thing, um, and I think local governments should have more of a say about what happens at a local level. But should people be obliged to work if they know that they're at risk by doing it? I, I think the important thing is that... 
um, which we're all doing, is follow directions, um, particularly the health directions, as much as is possible, with which both uh, uh, both uh, the women that just spoke then are doing. They have made wise decisions, but the government needs to understand, um, and so does business, to understand that those wise decisions throw up incredibly complex circumstances, which we've just heard. And the most important thing that people want is they want clear, concise, honest messaging with accountability. Michael Suka, can you understand why someone like Susan is confused? She's told to go to work and be amongst children, but then when she's at home, she shouldn't be with her grandchildren because she's at risk. Well, Hamish, um, obviously all of these decisions have come out of a, uh, an unprecedented national cabinet. Uh, some people refer to it as a bit of a wartime cabinet, which has brought together the Prime Minister and every state premier and, and territory chief minister. And it's a body of consensus and uh, it brings to the table the best health advice. I know, for example, uh, in my home state of Victoria that protocols are certainly put in place uh, for those people deemed to be in a higher risk category either because of their age or comorbidities. Uh, but I think, you know, again, to talk about that th there's no rule book here, this is but, a but very... But respect, can you see why someone like that is confused right now? Uh, I can understand, Hamish, why um, this being a very quickly evolving process where we've had um, relatively... Uh, light touch approach now to quite a heavy handed approach of people essentially being asked to stay at home having moved so quickly. Of course, I can understand, uh, Hamish, that confusion. What I'm saying is this is a an imperfect situation we find ourselves in. I know that the Prime Minister and the Premiers and the Chief Ministers uh, and all of their health advisors are doing their level best to try and manage the health objectives, but also to go back to the question earlier in the show not to be cavalier about decisions that would um, destroy somebody's livelihood or destroy their business. As Yana pointed out, the real-life example of how it impacts people, um, trying to manage those two things has meant, in conjunction with it being a quickly evolving system, that, yes, of course there is some confusion, but we have worked day and night, I can assure you, to try and get the message out to people, what the expectations of the National Cabinet is, how they can mitigate the risk for themselves and their families and their loved ones. Uh, and uh, we'll, we've got to keep working on it. We will, and we'll keep trying our hardest. OK, one question now from Damien Jelly in Bondi Junction, New South Wales. Hi, Q&A. My name's Damien Jelly from the Allegiant Gardens Music Festival. I'm a music promoter, and my question is to Michael Sakar, the Assistant Treasurer. Your stimulus package is for employers to keep on employees but all my workers are contractors. My full-time workers are contractors, my part-time workers are contractors. There's 700 contractors before a large event. Music promoters are cancelling events left, right and centre, having to hand out refunds. There's no stimulus package and there's a cash crisis. There's been a better reaction around the world for this from other governments. What is your government going to do in this crisis? So can he do anything to, to keep those workers on under the new arrangements? Well, again, Hamish, it really depends on the relationship and, and what we are doing is trying to maintain that employment relationship between employers and employees. But as I said earlier, uh, for those who are self-employed or sole traders, which sounds as some of his contractors would fall into that boat, that they will also be entitled to apply for the JobKeeper payment. And I know uh, that Paul Fletcher, the Communications Minister, uh, is uh, sitting down with the industry and looking at ways that we can assist because... But, but so um, they would apply as individual sole traders. They wouldn't be able to do something in connection with this individual who they're working with and have been working with over a long period of time. Yeah, correct. Uh, as announced today, Hamish, they would do that in their own right. But uh, as I think has been highlighted, our first package, $17 billion, our second package, 66 today, $130 billion. Um, we are keen to do whatever we can to assist affected industries. And I know the communications minister's engaging on this. Uh, this is not the end of the story. Uh, this will evolve. Our response will keep evolving. Uh, and that's the assurance that I can provide as far as uh, the arts industry goes. Michael Suka, Linda Burney, thank you very much for being with us. I want to turn thank this you. to Josh Pike. Uh, that's a question really about the industry that you're working in. Can you see that even though there's been all of this money rolled out today, uh, there's still a lot of questions that are quite difficult to answer. 
Yeah, I mean, obviously those questions probably came before the announcement um, and some of them have been answered in terms of sole traders and, and uh, self-employed people, but it's things, you know, our industry is very much a famine and feast industry, so we can have, you know, a quarter which is highly successful and then basically have nil income for two quarters. So we're, I find it confusing, and I'm, I know a lot of my musician friends and industry friends find it confusing to see how the eligibility criteria would, would, would uh, apply to us. So it is very confusing, but I do want to say it is, it is positive that you know, Paul Fletcher's been sitting down with the industry. That is really positive because there, is, there has at least been an, an, an acknowledgement of the myriad of business structures that we do operate under. Uh, Nikki Hutley, did any of the questions that you have get answered by the minister there? Well, not... No. Um, one question. Why on earth is a hairdresser an essential service? I'm sorry. I mean, I love my hairdresser and I rely <laughs> on her, but it is not an essential service. I think we can all do without that. And give them the certainty that they need. I think what her question was is, like, I, I don't believe I should be doing this job and if a beautician shouldn't. So my other question is I'm very deeply con confused about whether I can have both my daughters who live in different households and their partners over for dinner on Sunday night still. So that's the, the chief question that's, that's getting me. You'll have to WhatsApp the government <laughs> about that directly, Nikki. Uh, well, obviously more businesses are feeling the pinch right now. We're going to hear from Natasha Hawker in the northern beaches of New South Wales. She's an HR consultant to small business. Uh, how bad is it? I know you've described a, a bloodbath. Yeah, hey, Misha, it is actually a bloodbath at the moment. We're seeing businesses that are being exposed to significant risk. They're panicking, they're making rash decisions as they desperately scramble to save their businesses. On the flip side, from an employee perspective, they're exposed to legal, uh, sorry, to mental health issues, also to domestic and family violence and financial issues. We had a client with 15 employees literally in the last week who came to us and said, we need to make some people redundant, but basically what we're going to do is we're going to pretend that we only have 15 in two separate locations, so not pay redundancy. Um, are you going to help with that? And we said, well, no, we can't because it's illegal and that would expose us to accessorial liability. So we lost a client. The second thing that's happened is that we had another business that has let go or stood down some employees that have effectively terminated them. And when we said, you can't do that, their response was, well, tell Fair Work to come after me because I won't have a business by then. So what we're seeing is what people don't realise is that when this ends, and it will, that the law will remain and, and the and fair work will still come after you. And their breaches are significant. Fines for breaches are up to 63000 for the organisation and up to 12600 for the individual. That's the manager or the director. So we're going to have a whole lot of tsunami of legal action. And then what we're going to see is the great thing that we've seen today is the government has come out with the JobKeeper scheme to pay employees. And that's great. That's a government that wants businesses to hibernate and survive. That's great for employees and great for employers. So I would encourage every single business owner out there to get advice from Fair Work or a HR consultant or face the consequences. So what's your question then for the panel tonight? So my question is, what advice do you have for business owners to ensure that they do the right thing by their employees? Jennifer Westacott. I think it's an excellent question. I think the most important thing is... Um, to make sure that things are done by way of negotiation, obviously to check awards. Some of those awards have changed. I, I would really commend the ACTU for the cooperative way that they've looked at some of these big awards and given some of the flexibility that employers have wanted. Um, some of the, uh, the regulators have also said that they, they understand that they're going to have to be very flexible. Uh, and we need that flexibility, particularly in the light of these wage subsidies. We're going to need to be able to get people to take their leave. It would be terrible if someone was made redundant and they had uh, a big leave balance. To get them to work uh, different uh, days, you know, working three instead of five, we need that flexibility. And the, when I talk to the regulators, they say we are going to give employers that flexibility and that's very assuring to people. Um, I, I think it's really crucial, though, that things are done by way of negotiation with people in your workplace, obviously checking the rules. But I feel that this is a time, Hamish, where I've never seen people cooperate mm -hmm. 
on the level that they're cooperating, whether it's the ACTU and the employer groups, whether it's state and federal governments. It's, it's astonishing to see people trying to work things out. And, and what the regulators have said to us is, we're going to just try and problem solve our way through this. And, and I think that's important. Matt Common, is there a risk at a moment like this that you get a sort of frontier territory where people are just out trying to get everything out of it that they can and making mistakes, maybe even doing things deliberately? Well, I think it's certainly understandable that people are really concerned. If you're a business owner and you've had huge changes in your, your trading performance, it's quite understandable that people may be going to make rash decisions. That's why I think it's a combination of both the measures that have been announced by the government and us all increasing communication to make sure that they're aware of the different options that are available, mm. the ability to stand down employees, the way the JobKeeper uh, program is going to work. I mean, as you would expect, we, we deal with a lot of regulators in the banking industry and, you know, I really agree with Jennifer. I mean, this is a time for Australia really to come together. And I have to say over the last few weeks, uh, whether you see that politically and I think, you know, both uh, the government and opposition have really problem solved very well. Our regulators have come to us. They're all saying the same thing, which is we know that you need to make quick decisions. We're here to make sure that what you're doing is within within reason, but we understand that there's a different set of things that you need to be thinking about. Right? So Reprioritize. regulators have gone a bit easy on you? Well, I mean, they're, they're conscious of we've got a whole range of different issues that we're currently dealing with that we weren't several months ago. So in some cases, regulatory change has been pushed out. In other cases, we've been able to get sort of regulatory approval and sometimes guidance you know, in something that might take, from my perspective, a five-minute call to a commissioner at ASIC, which otherwise may have taken a lot of time. The prudential regulation... Is that a good thing, given all the problems we've had in the banking sector? Well, I think it's an exceptionally good thing, because at the moment, w one of the things that we need is a, a strong and stable financial system, which is what we have. Uh, we, the government's going to need to use uh, their balance sheet. The Reserve Bank have announced some unprecedented measures, and the banking industry has also announced... Uh, some very substantial measures. In the context of the Commonwealth Bank, mm. it, it's worth uh, approximately $10 billion uh, mm. over the next 12 months for customers who've been able to defer their interest repayments. So I think some degrees of flexibility, understanding, of course, that this, doesn't, this can't open the door for any misconduct or things, uh, failures that have occurred in the past. But I see in all arms of what, I, what we're dealing with across the industry, and that goes for the entire banking industry, people with a very clear intent this is a set of challenges that Australia hasn't faced before. It's incredibly complex. We have to work together to resolve and provide the best solutions for everyone. Nikki Hartley, I want to put one question that's been tweeted to us, but I understand a lot of people are asking this. How do we pay for this? Oh, gosh. Well, the same way we've paid in the past for, for our spending, um, and you probably have to go back to the Second World War, not necessarily to Australia, to think about when certain national governments were, were upping their debt to incredible levels to, to, to pay for defence. But um, it's not uncommon for the, the UK, for example, and the US to, to get to 200% um, debt to GDP ratio. And Australia started off in a much stronger position than that. So that's the encouraging thing. I mean, obviously, it's going to go up. And over time, we are going to have to pay for it slowly. And this will be a challenge for everyone because there's no, you know, magic unicorn raining money down on everyone. Ultimately, we as taxpayers will all have to pay for this over time. And that will make some very tough decisions for the government or governments in the future um, as to, you know, how do they do that? Do they increase the taxation base? Do they, um, you know, reduce expenditure in certain areas? But if you think, you know, the, the, the 2014 budget was, was difficult, I mean, uh, those are the sorts of decisions that will potentially have to be made in the future. Um, because if that was a was a, a budget emergency, by the time we get to the end of this, it's going to look a lot a lot starker. Do you worry about the future that your kids will inherit, Josh? Given what you just heard? Yeah, I mean, I think everybody does. It's not not just people in the entertainment sector. It's this is obviously a global issue. And uh, you know, I live in Sydney. Sydney's already a notoriously overpriced mm. place to live. Um, yeah, I certainly feel I feel extremely worried. Um, but I do agree with everybody that we all need to work together and try and remain optimistic because if we don't, I, th I don't think there's any way back from it. All right. Let's take our next question from Will Benson in Ipswich, Queensland. I'm a high school economics and workshop teacher in South East Queensland and I've been speaking with my students about the difference between real value and financial value. In Australia at the moment, 
the financial value of a nurse is only about $65,000 a year, whereas I'd argue that their real value to society is much higher than that. On the other hand, the financial value of a Commonwealth Bank CEO is about $8.36 million per year, and I would argue that their real value to society is much lower than that. Does the panel think that the COVID-19 crisis could be an opportunity for society to better recognise the real value of frontline workers. Uh, I think we've checked that out. It's your maximum potential income is the figure that he's referring to. Does it make you reassess the value of your work compared with others this moment? I mean, I, th I don't think there's any question that we all have a great degree of admiration for healthcare workers at any point in time, but particularly at the moment, because they really are on the front line. Uh, I mean, saving lives and also really putting themselves at risk. And that's why it's incredibly important that not only that they're compensated, but they're also protected. And a lot of what the, the measures that have been announced have really been designed to do is, of course, protect the overall healthcare system. I think it's very hard for a CEO of any company to sort of try and rationalise you know, remuneration levels across you know, different parts of the economy. So I'm not even going to uh, try to do that other than to agree with the premise of the question that... Uh, you know, healthcare workers are, are really are the heroes of what's going on at the moment. Jennifer Westacott, do you think this does make us as a society sit up and and reflect on the way we regard some jobs and the way some jobs are paid? Oh, I think it will. I think, you know, let, we haven't even talked about aged care where people are, are really uh, putting themselves on the front line here. Uh, protecting the most vulnerable people. And I think we do need to look at, you know, the funding levels for our health workers, our health system, uh, our WorkSafe organisations who are, you know, busily trying every day to get information out to companies and to individuals about how do we keep our workforce safe. I don't think there's any doubt that the way we think about work, the way we think about certain categories of jobs will change after this. Uh, and, uh, and, and that will be a good thing. I mean, for a long time, I think we've really undervalued the people who work in the aged care sector. Those people, including the, the point Matt's making about nurses, they are right on the front line. And of course, they provide an extraordinary and compassionate service to people. And I think it will be in time to pause and say, are we rewarding those people enough? Nikki Hartley. Well, look, can I just bring teachers into this? Mm -hmm. Because I don't think there's a parent in this country who isn't suddenly working out the value of a teacher. Um, yeah. You know, my kids are older, but I'm looking at my colleagues who are trying to homeschool their kids and do their jobs and suddenly appreciating the value of, of, of teachers. And it is... I mean, congratulations, what a great question and what a great teacher. Those students are in great hands because there is a huge difference between financial and, and, and intangible values to things. Um, we, we pay people what the market will bear. Economics has this whole rational theory about why things work in, in certain ways. And you can argue the same about why does a movie star get paid a certain amount. Mm. But, uh, but if we're saying you know, that the world that we will uh, live in after this might be quite different to the one beforehand, will we value things like supermarket workers as essential workers in the way that we see them now afterwards? I think we very quickly forget, unfortunately. Mm. And I think... Uh, we move on to the next crisis and obviously in the middle of this, which is, which is obviously horrendous, we, we have moved on from the bushfire crisis at the moment and climate change is still a very real issue and I think humans have a limited capacity for how many things they can deal with at one time and I think we also we deal with a crisis as it is but we very easily forget. So do I think we'll have a universal basic income? No. Do I think we'll suddenly start appreciating teachers more? I wish the answer were yes. What I do think, though, is that this crisis is teaching us to do some things mm -hmm. better. It is teaching us the value of social connection. It is teaching us that we can actually work remotely. And for women, that's a fantastic thing. The trust that we are putting in people and saying, actually, we're all going to work remotely. And we trust the flexibility that that will allow people, also people caring for their kids and saying, yeah, you can work at home and you can be flexible around that. For, for women's empowerment, this is actually teaching us some valuable lessons. So... There are some nuggets to be mined from the catastrophe that's, you know, happening around us. Yeah, I right. think that's absolutely right. I mean, we've got 23,000 people at uh, the Commonwealth Bank working from home at the moment. And, I mean, we, we wouldn't have believed that we could scale to that level. And the way people have just distributed it has been amazing, I think, across the entire economy. And just, I think other in other examples, people's behaviour does change really quickly as well. For example, we taped up 
our entire branch network is about 900 branches with social distancing. I was in branches on the Monday. People were sort of looking sort of curiously. By Wednesday, everyone is sort of looking for the, the square, moving to the next one. I mean, the, that whole change in and around social distancing from a matter of days in terms of you know, human conditioning, it shows actually there's some pretty fundamental shifts that are occurring. You've said you're not going to let any staff go through all of this. I think you're taking on some more. At the same time, there's all of these mortgage deferrals. How, how does that get paid for? Well, I mean, the way uh, mortgage deferrals work is, of course, we're basically putting it off. So a customer will have to pay it back just over an extended term uh, of time. And as you said, yes, well, we're an industry that would be considered an essential service. And of course, we've got lots of customers coming to us. And some of the examples that you've seen tonight are very representative of what we're seeing uh, in large numbers. And when I've been out in branches, you can see people coming in in tears and they're very concerned, anguish. There's obviously a number of people have been stood down over the last couple of weeks in particular. Uh, and of course, that causes um, us to have to take on extra staff to be able to deal with that, particularly in financial, uh, those requiring financial assistance, a lot of questions, a lot of people who are just scared and understandably are looking for reassurance. And so we're trying to bolster um, the number of people that we've got, particularly who can uh, take phone calls. And then we've been using a lot of our sort of digital channels to try and proactively outreach to our customers. We're planning on doing 250,000 calls to our elderly customers who would otherwise actually frequent the branch network uh, regularly just to make sure that we're maintaining contact because, of course, they've got the highest health risk and mm. uh, are most isolated at this point in time. OK. Our next question tonight comes from Kevin Carter in Kirrawee. My mother had many stories of rationing and problems with money and people being out of work during the 1930s. There's a talk of recession now, but are we actually in the grip of another world depression? All right, Nikki Hartley, this one really is for you. Uh, the technical definition of depression is a bit murkier than the technical definition of a recession. Well, it, it goes to, to length and depth of the, of the downturn. So a recession, we normally say, you know, technical recession, you've had two quarters, and we usually say maybe it could last up to, up to um, a year and a half, for example. Something more like two to three years is more like a depression and you're you're seeing a much deeper downturn. I mean, some people will say it's at least 10% drop in, in GDP. Now, it depends whose forecasts you, you believe. Um, certainly our latest forecasts don't look that great, but um, not quite at depression levels. And I think everything on this... I mean, one of my colleagues described this as, you know, trying to catch a falling knife. It's... It's never been more important for us economists to be forecasting and never more challenging for us to do so because everything is changing every day, as we've, as we've all said. We don't know what this is going to look like in three months, in six months. How long will these measures take place? If we get to the end of three months and there's suddenly a miracle antiviral and, and, and in, you know, nine months there's a, there's a vaccine, in the, the, you know, the rosy world of what could be the best-case scenario... You know, by Christmas, we could we be, could be looking back at this and people will still be getting back on their feet, absolutely. Lives will have been, you know, deeply impacted. But this could be something that we get through quite quickly. On the other hand, you know, it keeps spreading through the world. We take longer to do the vaccine. Anything is possible. And the absolute worst-case scenario that everyone is looking at could well be a depression. But that's the worst case. And I think Josh keeps coming back to... We have to be optimistic. We have to look to what is possible. There is no point in catastrophizing now, and it's very exactly. easy. I'm looking at this all day, every day, and it is easy to get quite wobbly about it. You've got to try and think, all right, what's the best case scenario that we still know can happen out of this and prepare for what might be worse, but still hope for what could be the best situation. And, and this is why, Hamish, can I jump in here? I think this is why the social distancing and the, and the kind of enforcement of that is so important and the kind of key message that we've all got a responsibility to make sure that we, we actually listen to the medical advice that's being given because the quicker we do that and the quicker we slow the rate of growth, the quicker we'll be able to sort of paint a picture of what um, returning to some kind of normal environment looks like. I think terms like recession and depression, you, you know, I think Nikki's done a terrific job of explaining those. But we've got to remember this is actually about a person's life and their job and how they're feeling today, which is terrified. But we've got a responsibility to say, well, you know, we, we did start from a stronger base. We will get to the end of this. 
uh, and we will be able uh, to come back from this and, and hopefully uh, if we, we keep our economy intact with a stronger economy and of course that will be uh, the best thing we can do because that will create new jobs, create the jobs that are there but that have gone coming back. But I, I really feel this is a kind of important kind of point that we've got to obey the health directions that we are being given. And when I see people disregarding them, I can't believe it because they, they, they say, well, I'm not going to get sick because I, I might get a bit of a cold. But the reality is they might give it to someone who's going to get very sick or die. And the reality is they might give it to one of their co-workers and force a further shutdown of the economy. And so my plea tonight is that we all take some responsibility and obey those instructions that we're being given. All right. Well, that is the point that we're going to end at almost. That's all we've got time for tonight. We promised each week to connect you with performance and tonight we're leaving you with some music. First, I'd like to thank our panel, Matt Common, Jennifer Westercott, Nikki Hutley and Josh Pike. That is your cue, thank Josh. You. Uh, and, of course, thanks to all of you for your many questions. Do please keep them coming in next week. Uh, we're going to be talking to our frontline health workers. They're risking absolutely everything to help stop the spread of coronavirus. Uh, there are some incredible stories to be told and we'll be uh, sharing some of those next week. Please do what you can to keep safe and others safe. Stay home, wash your hands, practice social distancing. You know the rules. Please stick to them.